This is a semi-cynical view that I've presented you of these things. I don't want to suggest that people don't at the same time earnestly believe right, that democracy is a good idea. And especially those who don't believe that government is serving their interests, they tend to think, yes, democracy should be extended to those. Now, in the context of this time, very few are arguing that African Americans deserve this, uh, this um, deserve freedom, and dem democracy has its limits there. Very few are arguing that Native Americans do, and, and very few are arguing that women do. All right, so we still have to keep this in some context. But at least by the 1820s, democracy is no longer a bad thing for most. <coughs> but this raises the question. If democracy is going to put the people in control, how do you ensure that the people govern themselves responsibly? How do you make sure that those fears that some of the founders had first expressed about democracy, right, like leading to chaos and spiraling out of control, how do you ensure that voters don't allow that to happen? One, one possibility would say, let's not allow, let's, let's make sure that ch change takes place slowly, right? And the U.S. Constitution in part does that, right? There's a whole system of checks and balances in which you know, the, the, the president can't just declare, though sometimes presidents today do, uh, can't just declare that this is the law of the land and we're going to, you know, we're going to do it this way, right? It has to go through Congress and if anybody challenges it in courts, it can work its way up to the Supreme Court, right? So the system of check and, checks and balances and divided government is one way of ensuring that, um, you know, that change happens at a pace that allows lots of different groups to participate in that discussion about change, right? So that's that's a that's a great uh, a great point. <clears throat> How do you make sure that the people who are going to the polls, though, are going to pass policies that are beneficial, not just to themselves, but to everyone? Yeah. I mean, two things. One is that about the poll of John Marshall in reaction to Jefferson extended the, the power of the Supreme Court to basically keep minority interests in, in, in power and, and to preserve mm -hmm. what he bought and then what he later. But I'd also, I would assume you're trying to get that education with Jefferson was a big fan of. Absolutely. I mean, one, one, one answer is the fact that the Supreme Court does increasingly, um, uh, well, some argue, right? This is a very contested issue. Your first point is an important one, though I would qualify it by suggesting this. What do you think the farmers in Western Ohio thought of John Marshall? No, he wasn't one of them. He was He's not one of them. He's an elitist federalist who's not going to serve democratic interest. Who does John Marshall have in mind whenever he passes his decisions? He has wealthy elites in mind, right? So that would be the argument that many would make about why the Supreme Court isn't at this time an agent of change or an agent of democracy. And you could even look forward to the, uh, to the Dred Scott decision in which the Supreme Court rules, or at least the Supreme Court justice says, African Americans can never be citizens of the United States, right? So I, I, I wouldn't suggest that the Supreme Court necessarily was a democratic no, institution. I was it's, yeah. it's keeping that. Okay. Oh, good. Then we agree. Um, <clears throat> your second point is key. How is it you promote democracy and democratic ideas? You promote them by making, and how do you make sure that the people can properly govern themselves? You promote them by instilling education within them. This was the context for a massive expansion in public schools, which had already existed in New England long before the American Revolution.
but grew in, in growing numbers elsewhere. This was the proliferation of Thomas Jefferson's ideal for what a university should be, which if you've ever been to Charlottesville, Virginia, you can see sort of splattered everywhere, right? The idea that a people must be educated in order to govern themselves well. <coughs> it also led many to conclude, right, because what the idea here was is that people need to be educated and they need to be virtuous. And as a result, even individuals like Thomas Jefferson and, and Benjamin Franklin, who were not, as I've suggested, necessarily uh, fond of what they saw as Christian um, uh, uh, mythology, or in their in their words, you know, kind of all of this mysticism or this, this, these miracles that exist within within Christianity. Franklin and, and Jefferson didn't really believe any of that, but they did think churches had a role in helping to preserve and perpetuate virtue. And as a result, both men uh, donated, uh, in some cases liberally, to, uh, to, to churches of a of, of variety of, of denominations. <coughs> I'll talk just a little bit more when we, when we and we will stop very shortly and, and move, and I'll show you some of the ways that you see democracy sort of physically around us here today. <coughs> but I want to talk about... Uh, another central point. And this highlights, I think, and connects back with something that you talked about yesterday, which is that um, because the U.S. was so spread out, and because of the nature of the U.S. Constitution, the system of federalism, which argues that both states and the national government are sovereign, or have ultimate power, that's kind of a weird thing, right? I mean, can't there only be one ultimate power? Well, the federal constitution suggests that there are kind of two, the federal government and the state government. Because of these concerns and because of the, the huge uh, land, just the geographic size of the United States, <coughs> many people believed that for democracy to work, these diverse groups needed to be connected. They needed to have ways that they, could sh that they could communicate with one another in a quick way. They needed to trade with one another in a quick way, right? Because if you trade with somebody, then you have a shared interest with them. And to keep democracy from spiraling out of control, which is what many people in the 18th century feared that it would, <coughs> many Americans, starting as early as George Washington, began to look for ways to create the infrastructure to connect Americans across a, a vast space. George Washington himself envisioned doing this by investing in canals that would ultimately connect the Washington DC area to the Ohio River. <coughs> Thomas Jefferson and his Secretary of State, Pennsylvanian Albert Gallatin, in 1806 with congressional support funded the National Road you probably are familiar with, right? <clears throat> Jefferson even had grander visions of roads that would spread all the way from Maine down to Louisiana, which he helped to usher into the Union in 1803. Now all of these roads served economic interest, right? How is it you can get your goods if you're a, uh, a, a corn uh, farmer in in northern Alabama to, to, to a potential buyer in, uh, in, in, in Ohio, for example. How can you do that? Well, you can build a road or some way of connecting those two. And that's going to make it easier for you and thus cheaper for you to get your goods from one area to the other. But politicians of this era also envisioned these, what are known as internal improvement projects, right? The building of roads, the building of canals. By 1820s, the building of railroads. Are they going to the railroad site in Nelsonville? Or no? No. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, these railroads also served political purposes. And those who supported these projects envisioned them as spreading American democracy and ensuring that it did not spiral out of control because it would make um, the American people one people. <coughs> 